Hello, fourth graders. This is Jason Brown with Boone County 4-H. Uh, just coming to you and trying to present to you some of the lessons we would have had here in class if we had been able to meet together. Uh, just like your teachers have been doing, we've been trying to come up with some ways to do these lessons, present them to you in a way uh, through our virtual sort of lessons and systems like that. And so that's what we're going to do today. I see a lot of Facebook pictures and I see a lot of things on social media that indicates that you're all doing really good and I'm really excited about that. I'm really proud of you as far as your ability to adapt quickly to the new environments that you're in. Uh, teachers have been doing a great job. Make sure you thank your teachers for their hard work as far as what they've done to, to keep you educated even though they're having to do it in some ways that are very new to them as well. So good job for everybody. We're going to look at bees today and talk about their life cycle, how they produce honey, things like that. And probably some of you, maybe you have grandparents or parents who have beehives and, and they're actual beekeepers. Most of you, I would guess, have tried honey before in some way. Uh, and I would guess most of you probably know the very basics about bees, like bees produce honey. And uh, worker bees, if they sting you, they die. Uh, and that's very true as well. And so you probably have a basic understanding, but we're going to go through some of these slides and it won't be as much fun, in my opinion, as being able to talk to you face to face and get some interaction from you. But I'm hoping by seeing this, uh, you'll be able to pick up and get some information about bees and that it'll help you out a little bit. I'm going to start by looking at wild bee colonies. And a wild bee colony can be up between about 50 to 100,000 bees in the colony. Uh, these two pictures are really good pictures, especially because it gives you a nice look at uh, what they look like in a wild setting. I would tell you if, and I know as, as students, you don't have maybe the control over this. Your parents probably do, and then you will one day. If you happen upon a wild bee colony or a swarm of bees, and we'll talk about swarming here in a few minutes, if you happen upon them, the best thing you can do is try to preserve them. Call your local beekeeper if you know one. Maybe call the extension office here at Boone County and try to find a way to remove them safely. I know the human response, especially if you have uh, allergies and things like that, they can pose a, a lethal threat. The first thought is to maybe spray or kill them. And I totally understand that point of view. The fear would be there. But if you happen upon something like this, try to preserve them. Because the more bees we have that we can save, the better chance that we'll continue raising the bee population. We'll continue allowing them to pollinate as they'll do, which is extremely important to um, our food production and fruits and vegetables and things like that. So if you see a wild colony like this, if you can, try to preserve them call the local beekeeper or the local extension. One thing I wanted to point out that I didn't know until a couple of years ago about bees is that they produce their own wax. If you've seen the honeycomb or the wax comb, I always thought in the past that the worker bees, they would go out, they would gather the wax material from nature, come back, sort of chew it up and start forming it. But what I learned is when they ingest the nectar and the honey, they have glands in their abdomen there that sort of produce the wax flakes and then they take the wax flakes they chew them up and they form um, the, the little comb that you see there i've been asked before in the past how how do they know to form the comb as they do how you know because if you look at a honeycomb it's, it's very intricate in its details um, the fact that every comb looks exactly the same every time there's a lot of questions about bees like that you'll have today that you'll want to ask me, how do they do this? What is their thinking? And the simple answer is that we really just don't know. It's a natural part of who they are. It's an instinctual thing. And it's amazing to watch them do uh, what they do. I also want to point out real quick the stinger right here. You can see the stinger on the female worker bee. And as most of you all probably already know, when a female worker bee stings, uh, they'll actually lose their stinger. It literally disembowels them if the stinger sticks in your skin and then their body is exposed and they'll die of dehydration later. And so that's uh, one of the, the pitfalls for the bee of, of stinging and defending uh, their hive or their themselves. Okay, so the three types of bees. We're going to start with the worker bee on the left. Okay, now if you've ever seen a bee out, like a honey bee out in nature, 99% of the time, what you're going to see is a female worker bee. 
You will very rarely see the drones and you will almost never see the queens. So if you've seen honeybees out, you have seen a worker bee. Uh, about 90% of the hive are these worker bees. They're all female. As we talked before, they have the stinger that can sting, uh, but if that stinger sort of sticks in the hide of the, the thing it's stinging, it can actually kill the, the worker bees. Now the worker bees, they literally do all the work. They scout, they forage for food, they take care of the queen as far as cleaning her and as far as uh, taking care of her needs, feeding her. They take care of the larva, the pupa. They take care of gathering honey and then storing it. They take care of making the wax and making the wax comb for their homes, for the, the nectar to be stored, for the uh, brood to be stored, things like that. So they literally do all the work. And because they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the summertime, they actually will only live after they've hatched out for about four to six weeks. They literally will work themselves to death because they do all the work and they're constantly working except for in the winter time when they're more dormant. Now when I do this in class, a lot of times I start talking about how the, the females, the worker bees, they do all the work and, and I name that list, uh, those lists of things they do. And usually the, the girls get kind of disgruntled about that. Yeah, it's not fair. I can't believe we're doing all the work. And a lot of times the boys will kind of be excited about that and say, yeah, we don't have to do anything. And uh, ladies, if you feel disgruntled about me describing how the, the female worker bee does all the work, don't worry, when we talk about the male drones here in a second, I'll tell you about uh, something that give you a little bit of satisfaction in the end uh, after it's all said and done. But looking at the drone, the drone is all males. Obviously, you can tell they're a little bit bigger than the, the worker bees, the females. They don't have stingers. Their eyes are a lot bigger, and they really only have one basic purpose. And a lot of times, they don't even get to fulfill that purpose. Their sole purpose is in the event that a queen is hatched, their sole purpose is to mate with the queen, fertilize the eggs so that she can start laying eggs and of course the colony can continue to thrive. And so they have just that one purpose. They're sitting around their whole lifespan waiting for an opportunity to come that most likely is not going to happen. And, and they're kind of useless feeders for the most part. I always think about, you know, if you've ever had that person that is sitting around watching TV a lot and uh, eating and rooting out of the, getting food out of the fridge quite often, uh, that's kind of what I think about with the drones. Now again, ladies, maybe you felt disgruntled about the worker bees being females that do all the work. Well, here's sort of uh, their come in, comeuppance for the drones. When it starts to get into fall and into winter, it gets a lot colder. And the colony views drones, these male drones, as useless feeders because they're just taking up food that the colony needs to survive the winter, those that actually are doing work. What will often happen is the female worker bees will take the, the male drones and they will kick them out of the hive and let them freeze to death on the outside. And so that's sort of their fate there. And again, if I'm in class, oftentimes the girls get a big laugh out of that and the guys are talking about how unfair that is. And it might seem unfair to you, but remember that bees, they don't have higher reasoning or moral standards that would say, uh, yeah, these guys are lazy, but it would be um, morally wrong to kick them out. They don't, they don't think like that. They think these guys are eating up food, they're useless, out they go. And so that's kind of a, it's a true reality, but it's also kind of a funny little moment. Looking at the queen, a queen will live about three to five years if she's healthy. If she's healthy, she can lay about 1200 eggs a day okay and that's a lot uh, but remember that because the worker bees are working so hard they're dying off by the thousands every day and so she's laying eggs at that level to keep up with the hive because if she's not laying eggs the potential is there uh, that the the colony could die out and go extinct okay uh, so she can lay about 1200 eggs a day it's really all she does spring summer and fall she does that the worker bees will feed her, they will clean her, they'll even, get this, help her go to the bathroom or the restroom. And so they do that for her as well. They take care of all her needs because it, she just lays eggs the whole time. That is her job and so that's what uh, she takes care of and that's what she does. So here's the honeybee, four stages of the life cycle. So basically that top, Right here, we'll get a pointer on it. 
right here at the top, the queen, she's going to lay the tiny little egg in there. It's about the size of a grain of rice. When that egg hatches into the little larva, now for the first seven days, all the larvas receive what's called royal jelly. And that's a substance that is excreted from the worker bee's head. There's glands in there that excrete this like nutrient called royal jelly. It's kind of a milky looking color. First seven days, all larvas get that. Once they reach a certain level right here, they will switch over and the worker bees will feed them what's called bee bread. It's a mixture of honey and pollen and that's what they'll start to feed them. Once they reach a certain level, they will cap that off. Now what's amazing is that the bees will make the cap according to what's inside the comb. If it's a worker bee, it's going to be a flat top. If it's a drone, it's going to be a nice big round top. And so in a sense, they kind of mark the top there so they know what is inside. Then as you can tell, it'll go through that final uh, last week of metamorphic process where abdomen, legs, wings, eyes, head will start to form antennae, and then it'll chew its way out. Now, if it's a worker bee, she will chew her way out, and she'll go and eat because she's not had much to eat uh, in the last few days. She's going to be really hungry. She'll come back, and amazing enough, she'll clean out the little area she was in so that she can recycle that opening and get it ready for another uh, egg to be laid in there. So they'll recycle those cells. Now, if it's a drone, uh, he'll get out, kind of clean himself off, uh, get something to eat, and um, because he only has one purpose, he'll go off and maybe watch some Netflix and eat some stuff out of the fridge, right? So, yeah, maybe that. Here's a little bit of look at the timelines. The honeybees differ as far as their process. So you see the queen there. She's an egg for three days. Four to five days, she's a larva. Eight days is a pupa uh, when she's enclosed in, and she'll emerge after 16 days. The worker bee, of course, you see is a 21-day life cycle. The drone is a 24-day life cycle. The drone, I guess, doesn't get in a hurry to do anything. Worker bees taking care of the queen bee here. Again, like we said before, remember that the queen bee does nothing but lay eggs, and they'll take care of her feed her, uh, clean her, all those things we discuss. Uh, one thing I want to point out, she has a red dot on her back, the queen, and that's really important. A lot of times beekeepers or scientists, they will follow uh, the queen by putting a red dot on her back. It makes her easier to see. She's less camouflaged if you can see that red dot. But also, when a queen dies and you change over to a new queen, sometimes there are things, there are predictors um, that can be made when that happens or not necessarily predictors, but the ability to look back and say, okay, now I know why this is happening. So as an example, if one month the beekeeper goes in and looks and the queen is there, she's got a red dot on her back and he puts her back and goes on his, his way. But the next month he opens that frame out and he looks inside and he finds the queen, but that red dot is no longer on her back. He can conclude that he must have a new queen. And that can tell him things like, okay, you know what? The hive is down a little bit. The numbers aren't as high as they used to be. It's because we have a new queen, okay? Because if she's not laying there for that 16-day process, that's potentially 16,000 eggs that aren't laid during that process time. So that's why the hive's down. Or he might say, hey, you know, I've noticed the hive has gotten really a bit more aggressive. And he finds that he's got a new queen. Well, she's a new queen, different sort of um, temperaments and things like that can lead to a more aggressive hive. And he can see that by seeing that he has a new queen. Here's a great cross section. And you can see those, again, rice shaped eggs. Um, this slide has the Cheerios honeybee. You see them there on the right. Interesting enough, I never could figure out why the Cheerios uh, honeybee is um, usually per a male when you see the cartoons and the commercials because they're obviously all females, but that's in there just to show how tired the worker bees can get doing uh, the work that they Hey, and things are getting a little more exciting there. Uh, a lot of times students will be creeped out by the larva, but that is those larva that have grown up to that pupa state about ready to be closed in. Uh, the ones you see right here, 
they're ready to be closed in. Here you can see on this side where you see the pointer, these are the very small ones and you can see that milky royal jelly down in there they're receiving for that first seven days. Again, their eggs and these other little parts that you see there and of course you see the honeybee they're feeding. Um, they're at different stages because they will hatch out at different times and then they'll sort of um, you know recycle that as we said and so different areas will have different types of, of stages that are going on. Again um, maybe a gross picture for you and a lot of times the students in class will kind of ew and uh, get grossed out a little bit. Hopefully not. They kind of look alien don't they and a lot of students will point that out as well. You've got the wings, you've got the, the abdomen that's forming, the eyes. This is that final stage where they're capped off, they're enclosed and they're going through that final metamorphic process that we talked about uh, that's going to happen to them. A good cross section you'll see here because what you'll see is the stages. And so, as you can tell from this one right here, uh, just starting to take on those metamorphic changes that are going to form body shapes, and then with each chamber going over to the left, you're actually getting uh, a little bit more progress. Matter of fact, this one here on the far left is probably just a couple of days away from hatching out and going on its way as far as starting its life cycle on the outside. See clearly antennas, you can see those hair follicles, legs, things like that that are starting to form. So the big question everybody wants to know, how do we come up with a new queen? What will happen? Well when it comes time for a new queen, uh, the process is pretty simple. Now what leads up to that would be a good question to ask. Sometimes the queen gets old and dies. Sometimes they, um, she gets sick. Sometimes, believe it or not, even though the, the bees, the worker bees, are completely loyal to her, sometimes there's something they don't like about her. Maybe she's sick and they feel or sense that, and she's not laying as many eggs. Maybe there's a temperament issue or something that they just don't like, and sometimes the worker bees can kill her and raise up another queen to be able to um, start that. Sometimes what will happen is a, a hive is without a queen and a beekeeper can actually buy a queen from another uh, beekeeper or location and they can introduce that queen into the hive there and sometimes that'll uh, the bees will be fine with that and she'll start laying eggs. Sometimes they're not so fine with that and what can happen is if you introduce a new bee into the hive that you've bought maybe from another beekeeper what can happen is um, they'll kill her and raise up their own queen. And so that can happen too. But for whatever reason, they need a queen. A lot of times what they'll do is, as you can see there in the picture with the two uh, enclosures there, they'll try to produce multiple queens. So you might have a couple of queens there that they're going to produce just to make sure that they in, they're insured that they'll have a queen. Because if they only raise one and she hatches and dies quickly then you've got an issue because you're having to take not just uh, 16 days to raise up a queen you're now looking at 32 days 32,000 eggs that are not being laid and that can be dangerous for the hive so basically they will take two larvae that they've just hatched out and they will feed them the royal jelly for seven days now when they're raising a queen the queens live on royal jelly their whole life okay so at seven days, if we're just raising a drone or a worker bee, they're going to cut off that royal jelly and start feeding the uh, honey and bee bread and things like that. But if they're raising a queen, like we're talking about now, they'll give them the royal jelly their whole life cycle. When it comes time to close them in, as you can see uh, from the picture there, their enclosure is going to need to be larger because the queen is going to be larger. And so you can see that. And so they're going to give her that bigger enclosure. 16 day cycle is up it's time for the queen to hatch out now what's interesting is a couple of things can happen here say this queen hatches out first what can happen is if this one is not hatched yet she might go over and start stinging through that enclosure and kill that queen in there because as you probably could guess there can only be one queen this one would be competition and by the way, queens have a stinger and they can sting multiple times and they don't die. Okay, so their stinger can't be pulled out. 
So she may go over and do that. Say they hatch out at the same time. They will then begin to fight each other because there can only be one queen. And if one of the queens is killed in that process, well, you have that queen there. Sometimes it ends in a draw or a tie. And what can happen is one of the queens will take some of the colony and they'll fly away and form a new hive. And it's swarming or something, that process that, that you maybe have seen a big ball of bees in a tree or somewhere like that uh, where they've swarmed around. It's just simply them looking for a new home. Matter of fact, a swarm like that is pretty harmless. Okay, And that's why earlier when I said if you can call your extension office or if you can call a local beekeeper when you see a big ball of bees in a tree or someplace like that, it's the best thing to do because they're harmless. They're just looking for a new home. And if we can keep them alive, they will continue to pollinate and we can continue to, to work to get the bee population up. And so you might see a swarm out because the queen, uh, there's two queens, they need to go and find a new place to live or one of those queens will. How do bees make honey? Okay, first thing that needs to happen is they need to find that food source. So they're gonna send scouts out to look around and find, maybe they'll find an apple orchard or maybe they'll find some other kind of orchard. Maybe they'll find a garden at someone's house. Maybe they'll find a field of wildflowers, something like that. Uh, once they've found that food source, they need to go back and they need to be able to um, communicate that to the other bees. They will actually do, and you've probably heard of this before, they'll do a honeybee's waggle dance. Okay, it's a series of vibrations and movements in that particular pattern that indicates to the recruits, uh, the other worker bees that are going to go out, where that food source is. And so as you can see there in the picture, you can kind of tell how uh, the one bee will begin by vibrating its body and it will walk in a circle eight pattern as it sort of does that vibration there. It'll always end up start back where it started, pointing in the direction of the food source. So if we look at a couple examples here on the right, the waggle dance would start, do that little dance there, and end up right there pointing back. Now if the hive's here and the sun is straight ahead, the food source is going to be straight ahead. So in a sense, the food is always uh, based on the proximity of the sun. So if, say, the food source is at a 30 degree angle to the sun, they'll point toward that food source, do that waggle dance around, end up facing forward. You can actually see videos of waggle dances all over uh, YouTube. Maybe watch some of those. If your parents are getting really, really bored, maybe they'll make you do a waggle dance just to keep them entertained for a few minutes. But that's how they communicate. They can't just sort of run back to the hive and scream loudly, I found food, everybody follow me. They're gonna do that waggle dance. Once that happens, the worker bees will go out and they're called foragers. Now, interesting fact, the foragers that go out to look for honey, they are older worker bees. And again, this isn't like they plan this. There isn't an organizational structure or a corporation that plans this. They just instinctually do this. Older worker bees go out to forage because if they're late in their life cycle, if they die, it's not as much of a loss to the hive. And so the older worker bees are the ones that go out. Once they go out, they'll start to uh, tap that flower, and you can see that in this picture. They'll begin to get that, that dust or pollen on their bodies, and that's what we talked about, the pollinization being so important. As they go flower to flower gathering nectar, they're dropping that pollen, pollinizing the flower. They also have these pouches or little bags on the back of their legs that will gather pollen. Again, remember, they will sort of mix that with the nectar to make bee bread and they'll use that to feed the larvae. And so that's an important part as well. As you can see in this picture, they're using their little proboscises to be able to, uh, the, the tubular like tongue draws that nectar up into their stomach. And then once they've done that, then they can fly on to the next flower. Or if they're full, they can fly back to the hive. Then fly it back. And now they've pulled that nectar down into their stomachs and in their stomachs, there are enzymes that mix in with that nectar. And that's going to be a big part of the production of what we know as honey. They'll take that nectar back. 
and they'll actually deposit it down into the little cells there and you can see in the pictures that little shine on the opening of those cells that's all that nectar they'll deposit it in there and then they'll take their wings and they'll flap their wings rapidly and that evaporates a lot of that water out of the nectar you know the nectar is very thin but as they flap their wings they begin to evaporate that and that's why a lot of times if you've tried honey it's very thick very sticky like it is because of that evaporation once they get a cell full enough they're going to cap that off okay it takes a long time to fill one of those little cells matter of fact one worker bee in her lifetime she will only produce something like a tablespoon of, of honey okay she will not produce that much honey in her lifetime and so it takes a while to fill that up but once it's full as you can see from some of the other ones they will cap those off and enclose those in now a part of the enzymes the wax there uh, what type of bee they are and where they're pulling the pollen from will have an impact on what the honey tastes like so if they're getting the honey or the nectar from a apple orchard your honey might have sort of an apple kind of taste to it if it's late in the fall honey where they're getting a lot of the nectar from clover and other sort of kind of plants like that in the wild in the late summer it's going to have more of that that type of taste to it so it's time to go out and get that honey as a lot of you have probably seen if grandma or grandpa or mom or dad have beehives uh, they've been out to get the honey and when they actually come to the hive the smart thing to do in my opinion is to wear the protective covering i know when i visit my brother's beehives i wear everything i can to not get stung because i'm a weakling and i hate getting stung uh, some of you are maybe allergic and absolutely if you want to have bees one day you're going to need to wear as much as possible most people would advise you at least wear the hood because nothing hurts worse than getting stung in the face i heard one lady talk about getting stung in the lip she talked about how really painful it was and so at the most they'll wear the hood they'll have their smoker there and the smoker is used they'll put like dry leaves and pine cones down in there and light that and get that to smolder what the smoke is is when you take the lid off of the beehive you're going to smoke down inside the hive that's a distraction to them and what that'll do is that will distract the the bees into thinking that the hive is on fire so they're more interested in thinking okay i'm in panic mode the hive's on fire something's really wrong they're more thinking about that than they are this big giant thing that's just popped the lid of the hive and is getting down inside the hive and looking around and so it's it's meant to be just a distraction Beekeepers, of course, they've come to collect rent, so to speak. You know, it's a, it's a mutual relationship, really, because the beekeeper helps take care of the bees, bees, does their best to keep them thriving and happy, and that's what they're going to do. And in turn, the bees get to live a good life and the beekeepers get some honey. Now, if the bees have not been producing as much as they should, the beekeeper won't take the honey got to leave some behind so they can live through the winter but say they've been really productive as you see in the picture the beekeepers are they're going to pull those frames as you see and they're going to take those and they're going to take some of the honey they're going to leave some behind to the shop the beekeepers they're going to start cutting off that wax covering now that wax covering is actually very useful a beekeeper is not just about getting honey it's about getting uh, byproducts from the bees that they can use so they can use that uh, the beeswax to make candles to make lip balms all kinds of things that beekeepers can use that honey that wax for and so they're going to do that but the main thing is to cut those caps off and expose the honey on the inside to put those honey frames down into this giant um, tub you see here and it's got a motor and it's got framing inside and what they're going to do is they're going to turn this machine on it's going to spin so fast that the force is going to push the honey out into the outside tub of, of that colander there or that that tub there and it's going to slide all the way down to the bottom with the the force of gravity open the outside there and let it drain on out now you see the little screen there you have to screen and sort of filter out the honey at least once because there's going to be wax and bee parts and all kinds of nasty stuff in there that you probably just don't want to eat with your honey. But I will say good beekeepers know not to filter their honey too much because if you over filter, you'll actually start filtering out the enzymes 
and the other little particles and bits in there that make honey effective as far as its benefit to us as far as a health food product. And so you don't want to strain it too much. Good beekeepers don't strain too much. They also do not preheat their honey so that it's uh, easier to pour and things like that because oftentimes a high heat will oftentimes will oftentimes uh, kill the enzymes and things like that. So limited filtration is what you want. Bottle that wonderful honey up after they filter that. You're going to go to the uh, the farmer's market or you're going to go to a place like that and get that honey. Now, real quick at the end, I do want to advise you about some places to get honey from. Um, sometimes going to like places like Kroger's or the supermarket, they've got good honey. You know, as an example, Kroger sells spilly honey. That's a good honey. You can rely on that. But not all honey at the supermarket is the best beneficial honey you can get. Matter of fact, um, a lot of supermarkets, because uh, supermarket honey, they, they filter it many times. They heat it up so that it can, it can be processed easier. Things like that that they do that's just not producing good honey. Sometimes the supermarket honey is not honey at all. Okay, uh, you have honey that's coming from places where they'll mix artificial flavorings through it. Uh, places like China produce honey that's mixed in with rice syrup and things like that. It's not real honey. My recommendation is to get local honey, maybe from a friend or someone. If you're looking at a big establishment that does honey, Spilly Honey, Krigger Farms, Kinman Farms, those are all places that do honey right and they are local, so I would recommend that. Additional resources, I highly recommend you watch these two videos. Now, I'm not sure if you can click on these and watch these within the PowerPoint presentation uh, or not. And so if you can't, the backup is going to be that your teacher will have those links and I'll make sure that they pass those on to you as well. They're really good videos, really entertaining. I think that you would really appreciate those as, as an addition uh, to the lesson that we've done today. Just to keep you in the know and help promote and continue to give the opportunity to be a part of 4-H programming, we are working on some virtual 4-H programs, just like you've kind of gotten used to with your schools. 4-H virtual project we have coming up. One thing we're working on is we're going to do a video tutorial on YouTube showing you how to do the project. And then after you've seen that video, there will be instructions in the video on how to come and get the project kit from us. That will be available here at the Extension Office. You'll take that home and with the help of the YouTube video, you will complete that project. And then we would invite you to maybe post a picture of the finished project on our Facebook page. As it says there at the bottom, there will be more details coming with the tutorial videos. Uh, but we kind of just want to get you an idea of what we're working on and what's coming. Okay, so what should you do? Well, the first thing you want to do is have a parent join our Facebook page and watch for details. Hey, you're not getting the newsletter now and some uh, sort of interactions we would have had are not happening, obviously. So if you join the Facebook page, you're going to get a lot of information on the updates. And it's going to be the Facebook page where here in a couple of weeks you will see these YouTube tutorial videos posted. And in that video, it's going to tell you uh, how to get the kit, then when you get home, how to put it together with the help of the tutorial video. And so it's important that you join the Facebook page to try to keep connected with the things that we're doing right now. The second thing is if you have not joined 4-H yet, we would love for you to do so. And so you need to do that. You can follow the link there and print out the enrollment form and you can fill it out and either mail it in to us or you could print it off scan it with your copier as a PDF and send it to me. I'll have my email posted on the next page so you can send that in and get that done electronically if you don't want to actually come out to the extension office. And here at the very last, thank you. You know, uh, obviously, I would rather see you in class. We'd all love to be there, but I really appreciate you all having uh, taken the time to sit down and listen and go through this little PowerPoint presentation and be able to do this. My contact information is there. Again, maybe it's related to your parents enrolling you in 4-H or any kind of questions they might have about 4-H programming, email, call, anything like that. My hope is that we'll be able to see each other very soon. If not, 
uh, hang in there. I hope everybody has a great summer. Keep your eyes out for what we're doing here at 4-H and uh, sort of be a part if you can.